you have your Bibles tonight, and I hope you do, um, we're looking at a passage in connection with the Lord's Supper that many of you have read, read perhaps dozens of times, one that we've touched on many times. It is the go-to passage, if you will, for the Lord's Supper that uh, people look to for direction and for a time of remembrance. Cindy and I were traveling many years ago. We, I'm talking about internationally. We, we'd had the privilege of traveling to Europe and Asia and Israel. We were traveling. We learned some things. We learned about, for one thing, how different our culture is from other cultures around the world. Um, Americans are very, very different the, I mean, from Europeans, we, our habits are different. Even the time that we eat our evening meal is different. Typically, Americans eat, dine supper for supper from anywhere from five to seven, typically, and Europeans tend to eat from seven to nine. Uh, they eat later. Americans tend to have expectation of quick service, regardless of where they're at. That is not a European custom. Europeans, meal times for, especially evening meal times, are for quiet conversation. And Americans want to get their food and, and have it expeditiously. Even sit-down restaurants are faster than fast food restaurants, I think, over there. Um, just have a whole different concept. Americans tend to be loud. When we were dining at one hotel we were staying at, we were in the dining room in the, in the morning for breakfast, and uh, you could tell who the Americans were in that room. It just very loud, uh, loud talkers. We want things, and we want them now. We look at schedules. We look at the clock much more than places, other places in this world, especially uh, the Far East. They're, we are very time conscious. We want our fast food fast. <laughs> I'm told that there's a place in New Jersey, a fast food place called Eat It and Beat It. <laughs> the idea is that get your food, eat your food, and get out. <laughs> I read once <clears throat> of why the chairs in places like McDonald's and Burger King are as uncomfortable as they are, and someone said they're purposely designed to be uncomfortable so you, you won't sit there very long. I don't, I don't know. That sounds logical to me. <clears throat> we are time-conscious and especially other cultures like in Thailand or um, Cambodia. A friend of mine was, I think he was at, uh, there was an Asian group called Hmong people. They're a, mostly a tribal people in Vietnam, Cambodia. I think they're in Laos as well. Um, large Hmong community here but he said to me, he was at their, one of their weddings and it was supposed to start, I can't remember the starting time, but he did tell me it started about two and a half hours after they were supposed to start. And he said at the time they were supposed to start, they were still decorating. Yeah, they just, it, we were at a Mideastern wedding. In fact, I was, uh, I was asked to speak at a Mideastern wedding and uh, it was supposed to, I think, start at what, one o'clock? And it started a little after two. <laughs> um, people just sitting, waiting for. Give you an idea, the groom was helping decorate. And um, I think the wedding was supposed to start at one, and he left at 10 till to go get ready to go get dressed. He was helping decorate. <laughs> it, no, it just no sense of, no sense of time or the or or being, on a schedule. <clears throat> 
Americans are in a hurry. We want things to start on time, move along expeditiously, and end at what we consider to be a reasonable hour. But again, what we consider as a proper way to be is not what the rest of the world is. So whether or not we are right or wrong is up for debate, I guess. But there is one thing that we need to be to take care that we do not rush through. And that is the Lord's Supper. I think often it is it is considered to be a minor part of our faith. And sometimes I think the preacher thinks that the Lord's Supper is secondary in importance to his message. And sometimes I've sat through sermons that have dragged and then sprinted through the Lord's Supper as if it was a non-event or just something that we tack on. When we come to the Lord's Supper, this is something that we need to reflect on. And as we're doing right now, that uh, we need to linger. We need to reflect. The emblems are sacred. The meaning of them is sacred. So, <clears throat> as we've done many times before, I want to take some moments and reflect on what the Lord's Supper does for us. So let's um, bow our heads in a word of prayer, and then we'll begin. Father, as we contemplate and meditate upon this ordinance once again, I pray that you might quiet our hearts and draw our attention to the gospel. It has changed our lives. It has changed the direction of our eternity. There's enormous meaning in this, and so we pray that you might help us to reflect for a bit about, upon this wonderful ordinance that you have left to us. Help me to be clear. Help these folks to be attentive. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Among other things, the Lord's Supper reminds you of the commitment that Jesus made to you. It reminds you of the commitment that Jesus made to you. In <clears throat> chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul recalling the Last Supper said, after the same manner also, I'm talking, I'm, I'm reading verse 25, after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This cup is the New Testament. What is a testament? Testament's the same as a covenant. Well, okay, what's a covenant? It is the same. A testament is a covenant is the same as an unbreakable promise. A promise that is unilateral. It is a commitment To us, this is the, this cup is the new promise, covenant, testament in my blood. This is the commitment that Jesus made to his disciples the night that he was going to be crucified. And he talked about this cup and what the contents represented. And he said, this is, this is my promise to you. This is initiated prior to anybody, <clears throat> anybody at large receiving him as Savior. This is a covenant that he has made, a commitment. And it's a commitment made in blood. It's a testament made when perhaps you were, well, all of us, not interested. There was a time when I had no interest in the things of God. None. And yet... That was a commitment, a testament in his blood that was made before I was born. Scripture tells us in Romans chapter 5, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. 
For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die, but God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ shed his blood as a testament, a commitment. And then he says, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. He laid down the promise. This is his commitment. A covenant offered while we were yet sinners. Do you think about the blood that was shed for you, the sinner? Sometimes I think we, especially if we've been saved a while, and maybe you Maybe you were raised in a Christian home and you really didn't have um, the, quote, sinful past. But that really doesn't matter if whether you had the, lived, you know, wild, a wild, lost life or you were raised in a moral environment. The recognition of sin is the same, the depth of it. I was uh, reading an article by a Jewish man, actually, um, conservative Jew by the name of Dennis Prager. I don't know if that name rings a bell with you. but <clears throat> He wrote a very insightful column about goodness. And again, to my knowledge, he has not received Christ. But he said this. He said, no issue has a greater influence on determining your social and political views than whether you view human nature as basically good or not. In 20 years as a radio talk show host, I have dialogued with thousands of people of both sexes and from virtually every religious, ethnic, and national background. Very early on, I realized that perhaps the major reason for political and other disagreements I had with callers was that they believe people are basically good, and I did not. He goes on to state, he went on to state that the problems that arise from believing that people are born good, the most notable went like this. He said this, if you believe that people are basically good, God and religion are morally unnecessary, even harmful. If you believe that people are basically good. Why, he said, would basically good people need a God or religion to provide moral standards? Do you catch his reasoning there? If you're basically good, then why do you need God? And the answer is, you do not. When we come to communion, we are agreeing together. When we come to the Lord's Supper, we are agreeing together that we are not good in and of ourselves. We're not basically good. We are basically <laughs> with a depraved nature and Jesus said this is my testament this is my promise this is the blood that was going to be shed because of our sin here in his love first John 4 10 not that we love God but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins he died not for good people he died for bad people and who falls under that umbrella? <laughs> you and I. We all fall under that umbrella. As we come to the Lord's Supper, we need to remember that Jesus' commitment was to people who are sinners. And it was from him to us. So it reminds us of his commitment. It also serves to remind us that we have a savior and not a religion. We have a savior. You know, there are religions that, really, that have no saviors. There are, there are religions that have no God, no personal God. Buddhism is a, is a religion that has no personal God. There are faiths out there that have no sense of the, of the otherworldly and certainly no sense of a God who gave his son for us. Now, notice in verse 24... Uh, Jesus, when he gave him thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of, <clears throat> what's the word? Me. Jesus said, I want you to remember me through this. This is something that I want you to, 
I want to remind you, not of religion, not of a faith. He wanted us to remember him. Do this in remembrance of me. Some, sometimes, and I think in many churches, we forget that the ordinance of the Lord's Supper is not the point. The, the ordinance itself. It's not the point. The person is the point. There are some churches that have the Lord's Supper, or what they would call the Lord's Supper, every single week. And the, and the ordinance is the point for them. Someone was telling me this morning, uh, they, they came this morning expecting, expecting the Lord's Supper. And, sorry, it's tonight. Um, but then they said this. They said, you take it seriously. And the answer to that is, yes, I do. Because the directive came from, it came from Jesus. And it was something that we were supposed to be thinking. He wanted us to remember him. So the thing that we're doing is not the point. The thing that we're doing reminds us of who we are indebted to and who we, we are grateful to. There's, there was a church, an, a new pastor had followed a pastor that had been at the church some 25 or 30 years, which is, I guess it's not the usual, uh, that length of time for a pastor, but this pastor had been there 25, 30 years, and he resigned, and a new pastor came in, and, and after his first Lord's Supper service, some of the folks came to the new pastor and told him that he was not doing the Lord's Supper right and he replied to them all that he thought he was doing it right <clears throat> but they insisted that he was not they had told him that the last pastor always touched the radiator before he distributed the cups and the and the bread always touched the radiator and this was becoming a source of friction in the congregation that the new pastor wasn't doing it right. And so the new pastor contacted the previous pastor and, and asked him why he always walked over and touched the radiator before he distributed the elements. And he told him that the reason was he wanted to get rid of any static electricity that might have gotten on him so he wouldn't shock anybody. And over time, people thought it was part of the ritual. I'm told that the church was called by some in the community the Church of the Holy Radiator. But for them, the ordinance became the point when the ordinance pointed to a person. This is not supposed to be a religious practice in and of itself or a ritual in and of itself because that this ordinance points to the person of the Lord Jesus. So it reminds us that we have a savior, not a religion. The Lord's Supper also reminds us, and this is in a different passage, uh, still in the book of 1 Corinthians, but in chapter 10, it might, reminds us of our exclusive relationship with him and with other believers. In chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, uh, it talks about what we would refer to as communion or the Lord's Supper, that it means an exclusive fellowship with the Lord. Now look, um, look at verse 20. Many of the Corinthians were trying to play both sides and were thinking it was okay to participate in feasts, honoring the false gods that their neighbors worshipped. And what Paul is trying to tell them is that this table is exclusive. So in verse 20 he says, But I say that the things with the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. He's talking about the Lord's Supper here. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table 
and of the table of devils. Why? Because they're mutually exclusive. The demonic, the idol worshipers worshiped the demonic, and when they participated in any kind of meals or representations like that, they were looking to that which was demonic. To sit at Jesus' table meant you were part of his household and not a part of another household. So communion means exclusive fellowship with the Lord. He said, you just can't do that. You can't fellowship at the same table. But communion also means exclusive fellowship with the Lord's people. Look back a few verses uh, from where you were in 1 Corinthians 10, 16. He said, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold, Israel of the flesh are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar. What he's saying here is that this is something that is in particular bonding to all of us. You realize when you partake together of this, there is, a, there is an agreement among us all. If you partake of this, there is an agreement among us all that we are all unworthy sinners, unable to earn our way in our acceptance with God, but that we all subscribe to the one person who can bring us to him and make us acceptable with him. It's a, it's a fellowship that we share, a bond, if you will. Just as Israel had the uniting commonality of the altar of sacrifice as more partakers of that altar, we show who unites us. And when each of you partake of this, you show your relationship with him and with every other believer in this room but partakes as well. There's to be sense, a sense of unity and fellowship, both with the Lord and with his people. That, that commonality is, is the glue that unites, that is supposed to unite, unite a church family. That ought to be inviolable. That is, my experience in churches through the years is that people break fellowship with other believers very, very frivolously sometimes. I mean, I, I have known of stories of that just seemed bizarre to me. Churches splitting over the color of carpet. Churches on the verge of, dis- of explosion over moving a picture from one place to another. I kid you not, the real <laughs> incredible. People who say they share a savior represented by the, the elements of, that we're going to partake of tonight, that we are all engaged, we are all sinners, we all need the same savior, we all need that same sacrifice. It is humbling to know that we are, that, that we are a needy people, and that is the thing that unites us. And then on a, on, on, for some frivolous, shallow, dare I say stupid reason, they break fellowship and leave, go somewhere else. Menial things, relatively little things, taking front and center stage as if the main thing just doesn't matter anymore. And what is the main thing? The person and work of the Savior. This, what we're participating in this evening, is, is representative of something that ought to tie us together with an unbreakable bond. And yet how easy it is for people to exalt a relatively minor thing. And and I understand we can aggravate each other (laughs) sometimes. Uh, We can get miffed over something that is said or, or not said. And we begin to exalt that thing in our minds. It becomes a sticking point and it becomes, at least in our minds, bigger than what unites us But the fact is, it's not bigger. It is infinitely small as compared to what unites us. 
But people will break fellowship over very small things in comparison to what is supposed to unite us. So, the Lord's Supper reminds us of our exclusive relationship with the Lord and with one another. Now, some of the things that I'm sharing tonight, will uh, they dovetail with other points, but in addition, it reminds you, the Lord's Supper reminds you of the magnitude of the price paid on your behalf. The magnitude of it. If you were kidnapped by terrorists and someone de- demanded for your release, they demanded, oh, pick a number. Let's, let's go with $10 billion. All right, well, let's lower it down. Can you imagine anyone forking over $10 billion for for you I don't know anybody that has that kind of money or <laughs> you know would do that you know people I mean there are people who would do it if they could do it but they can't that's an incredible amount of money that someone would bestow that kind of value upon you that they would do that it's almost overwhelming to think that someone would, would do that. Maybe even impoverishing themselves in the process so that you could be released, that you could be free. Jesus said, this is my body, representative of my body, which is broken for you. Now, the Bible's pretty clear that Jesus did not have a broken bone. All right, I mean, John chapter 19, verse 34, one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came out there out blood and water. And he, he that saw it bear record and his record is true and he knoweth that his, what he saith is true that you might believe. For these things were done that the scripture be fulfilled, a bone of him shall not be broken. Sometimes believers misunderstand this term when he says this is my body which is broken for you when bread was distributed when bread was served bread was in these usually kind of a oval loaf and it wasn't already sliced you know we use the use the term now the the, be, the biggest thing or the best thing since sliced bread right Bread wasn't sliced, and so when they distributed it, they would break off bread and distribute it. And so the term broken came to mean served up. So no, Jesus' body was not broken on the, in, in terms of his body, broken, but it was served he was served for you and I. Hence the term. The one who would substitute bodily for you. This is my body which is served up for you. And this was the one who shed his precious blood for you. This cup in this passage, this cup in the new, is the New Testament in my blood. This is, I am serving up to you my body and my blood. Well, Hebrews 10, 19 says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holy list by the blood of Jesus. Entering into the holy place by what? The blood of Jesus. You could not have come close to the holy place except for the blood of Jesus. 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all our sin. From all sin. 1 Peter tells us that we are not redeemed 
1 Peter 1.18, we are not redeemed, purchased with corruptible things as silver and gold from our empty manner of living, received by tradition from our fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. It, this blood, it wouldn't have been sufficient for anybody else to die. It had to be him, because it was his life that was precious. He was the embodiment of righteousness. He was the one, the only one, that was pure and clean and worthy to compensate etern for the eternity of all of us. He was the only one. There was a story told by a chaplain, Robinson. His father, he said, had just returned, was getting out of the service after World War II. He got out in 1949. And he said at the time, on about every highway, you could see soldiers hi uh, <laughs> not hijacking, Hitchhiking. There you go. But they're hitchhiking for rides. And he said, said that his dad had just come home, but he had come home to a very sorrowful time in his family, which was his grandmother's illness. And he got home about the time that, there's, that there was this really bad problem. It had to do with her kidneys. And so the doctor had told this man's father, this Chaplain Robinson's father, that his mother needed a blood transfusion immediately or she would not survive the night. And she had a rare blood type, AB negative, very rare. And in those days, there were no blood banks. And, so, and, and they could not locate anybody with AB negative blood, very rare type. And so he said the doctor gave the family very little hope and that his mother was not going to live the night. And so he said his father went home to, uh, to change his clothes and then returned for the inevitable goodbyes. And as his father was driving home, he passed a soldier in uniform hitchhiking. Deep in grief, he said his dad was not going to stop, but something, something compelled him to pull over, and the soldier climbed in, but he said, my father never spoke. He just continued driving down the road toward home, and the soldier could tell that my father, he said, was upset as a tear ran down his cheek, and so this young man, this soldier, asked him what was wrong, and his father began telling the stranger that his mother was going to die because the hospital couldn't find anyone who could donate AB negative blood. And so his father explained that he was heading home to change clothes. And then he looked over at that young man riding next to him and he said he noticed a soldier's open hand holding dog tags that read A, B, negative on those tags. The soldier told my father to turn the car around, he said, and head back to the hospital. This young man, this chaplain Robinson told about his grandmother he said she lived until 1996, 47 more years. And to this day, the family doesn't know the name of that soldier. They lost track of him. And he said, my father wondered if that stranger really was a soldier, if he was an angel in uniform. Well, I can guarantee he wasn't an angel. God had provided the right blood, not just blood, but the right blood that saved that grandmother from dying. And when we, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we need to remember it was not simply the shedding of blood, but it was the shedding of the right blood. Exactly what we needed. The perfect blood of Jesus to save us Because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. And this blood is, is the only thing that could suffice. It was precious. So precious that the Corinthians were warned about how they participated in this. Because they were treating it lightly. Frivolously. Insofar that God judged them for it. Look at verse 27 
of chapter 11. He says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, and what we're talking about here is an unworthy manner, whoever does that unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he, he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eats and drinks condemnation, damnation to himself, not discerning or thinking about the Lord's body. And he says, for this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. God judged them with illness and with even death because of the way they were partaking. Why did it matter? Because of the preciousness of what we're doing. That's why it mattered. I may have shared with you that Cindy and I once visited a church. I think maybe I have. Some, some of you probably remember this. I think I have shared this. But we were in a church. It's been a while back. And it was, <laughs> suffice to say, we weren't very comfortable. There was a band, and the whole place was dark, and the stages lit up, and there was, it was, it was basically a production, and people were up during the quote worship time, and it was a, there was a lot of this and a lot of a lot of swaying and a lot of gyrating, and it was. It was I won't explain why we were there. I'm, I'm not going to go into all that. I'm just saying. That was the way it was, very uncomfortable. But during the band and during all of this rocking out music, people were moving in and out from back to front. And we, both of us were looking at, what in the world are people doing? And just randomly, just on their own, would move out and they'd go up front. And then they would look like they were chewing on something. But they had a communion table up in the front. And then randomly, it just whenever it, whenever anybody wanted to, or if they didn't want to, they would come up, grab something, and you know, they'd drink a little cup, and they'd eat something, and they'd come back and then join in the fun again. And that's what it was. It was joining in the fun, in my opinion. But when I found, I asked later, I said, what were they doing? He said, oh, they were, they were going to get going up and get communion. And I thought to myself, wow, it, not a whole lot of sp- special going on there and this was something they did every week this is pretty much it just lost its specialness we are not to we are not to deem this a common thing we need a sense of the preciousness of what was given on our behalf It was not just any blood. It was the blood of our Savior. So all of these things, it reminds us of the commitment Jesus made. It reminds us that we have a Savior, not a religion. It reminds us that we have an exclusive relationship with him and with other believers. It reminds us of the magnitude of the price paid. But then finally, it gives us a chance to rehearse a really good story one more time. Really good story. Look at 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, what's it say? You do show the Lord's death till he come. The subtle idea behind this is that this is something that should be told over and over and over again. And this is one way we can do it. You are showing the Lord's death. Sometimes people will suggest watching a movie and, no, I've seen it before. I've seen that one. No desire to see it again. Wasted two hours of my time, of my life, watching it the first time. I'm not going to watch it again. It's not worth that. Most flicks... They're not, worth, they're not worth seeing the first time, let alone seeing over again. But in this, we get a chance to rehearse grace. We get a chance to remind ourselves and tell, and not with words per se, but with actions, we get to tell 
that story among ourselves and to ourselves. And when you tell this story, you're in a sense telling your story. This is a story, this is a story that I can say truthfully changed my life. When I accepted Christ as Savior, when I trusted Christ as Savior. A message that literally changed my life. Impacted me. I hope you can say the same. That this is not just something that, well, I was raised this way. That's why I'm I'm in church because I was raised this way. I hope that is not your story. Well, it's something I've always done. I'd feel like something was left out of my life if I didn't go back, go to church. I hope that's not your story. I hope your story is, Jesus saved me. And it has, I am overwhelmed with the grace of God in the person and work of Christ. It is a pleasure to be able to rehearse this. Most of you are old enough to remember a a, uh, commentator by the name of Paul Harvey. He told a story. He told it originally in 1977. I think it's on his, uh, that radio program, The Rest of the Story, or The Rest of the Story. (laughs) He talked about an old man who visited an old broken pier on the eastern sea coast of Florida every Friday night until his death in 1973, this old man would return walking slowly and slightly stooped with a large bucket of shrimp. And when he did, the seagulls would flock to this old man and he would feed them from his bucket every Friday night for years. What was that story? Well, many years before, in October of 1942, Captain Eddie Rickenbacker Rickenbacker was on a mission as a passenger in a B-17 to deliver an important message to General Douglas MacArthur in New Guinea. But there was an unexpected detour, which would hurl Captain Rickenbacker into the most harrowing adventure of his life. Somewhere over the South Pacific, this B-17 became lost beyond the reach of radio, and fuel ran dangerously low. And so the men and the crew, including their passenger, were forced to ditch their plane in the ocean. And for nearly a month, Captain Eddie Rickenbacker and his companions would fight the water and the weather and the scorching sun in addition to sharks hitting their their rafts. But the biggest, the biggest formidable foe that they faced was starvation. After about eight days, their supplies ran out. Lack rations were long gone or destroyed by the seawater. And they had gotten to the place where they said only a miracle is going to save us. But a miracle occurred. In Captain Rickenbacker's own words, the captain, William Cherry, whom they referred to as Cherry, read the service that afternoon. And we finished with a prayer for deliverance and a hymn of praise. There was some talk, but it tapered off in the oppressive heat. And Rickenbacker said this, with my hat pulled down over my eyes to keep out some of the glare, I dozed off, and then I realized that something had landed on my head. And I knew that it was a seagull. I don't know how I knew. I just knew. And everybody else knew, too. No one said a word, but peering out from under my hat brim without moving my head, I could see the expression on their faces. They were staring at that gull. And that gull meant food. And he thought to himself, if I could catch it. And the rest, as they say, is history. Captain Eddie caught the gull. Its flesh was eaten. Its intestines were used for bait to catch fish. Survivors were sustained and their hopes renewed because of a lone seagull, uncharacteristically hundreds of miles from land, offered itself as a sacrifice. Captain Eddie Rickenbacker made it, as did the rest of those men. 
And as Paul Harvey said, and now you also know that he never forgot because every Friday evening about sunset on a lonely stretch along the eastern Florida seacoast, you could see an old man walking, white-haired, bushy-eyebrowed, slightly bent. His bucket filled with shrimp was to feed the gulls, to remember that one which on a day long past gave itself without a struggle. Jesus says this, I want you to do this, and I want you to do this in remembrance of me. This is the New Testament in my blood. This is the means by which you were justified. This is the reminder that he gave himself for you and for me. That's the gospel story. And we get to tell it again the way the Lord himself asked it to tell it among ourselves this evening. So let's bow our heads in a word of prayer and we'll, we'll engage in this wonderful rec recollection. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. And I pray, God, that you might bless our time together as we share around the bread and around the cup. In Jesus' name.